Awesome. Hey, if there's one thing that all of us are bad at, every single person in this room that we're all bad at, it's this, forgetfulness. Now, before you, um, you know, get frustrated with me and, and pride yourself on remembering things, the forgetfulness I'm not talking about is losing your keys, right? I lose my keys all the time. If you know anybody from our core team, uh, they would always, like after church, they would have to be on a search for my keys. And so now I have a tile, and so I can just like beep it. But the forgetfulness is, it, what I'm talking about, is not forgetting your keys or forgetting an appointment. The forgetfulness is not remembering who God is and who we are. That's the forgetfulness that we all share together. We are forgetful people. Let me explain. When you and I worry we are having a moment of forgetfulness. We're forgetting God's promises. The fact that he said, I'm going to take care of you. We're forgetting that he's provider. When you and I sin or do something that is not in line, in, in line with God's heart, we are forgetting the blessings of obedience and the life that obedience brings. Another one is when you and I get in a comfortable place and we start to begin to believe our press clippings and, um, you know, we start to get a big puffy head. We're forgetting that even on our best days, we are sinners in need of God's grace. We're not that impressive. God is impressive. Remember, he's omnipotent, all right? We are not. And today we continue um, our study through Deuteronomy, but we're starting a new series in that called Remember, and this whole premise of this series is, is acknowledging the forgetfulness and committing ourselves to remember who God is and who we are, all right? And we're still in um, this book of Deuteronomy, and in this section of the book, Moses turns his attention to the Israelites because they have a tendency to wander, all right? They wander, and their ancestors had a big problem with this. If you know anything about the Old Testament, remember the Israelites wandered through the desert for 40 years? It's because they forgot God's promises and were disobedient, and so God led them through the desert for 40 years. And so Moses takes a long effort here in this section to Use the words, remember, remember, don't forget, do this, put your attention to this, because I want you to remember who God is and who you are. But more than that, he's wanting uh, them to see that they're going to forget their forgetfulness. That's a mouthful. They're going to forget their forgetfulness. And so he's reminding them to say, be aware of this, anticipate this. He wants them that they're going to have, he wants them to see that they're going to have the same tendency as their ancestors, all right? They're the same people. And for us today, what I want you to see is we're the same forgetful people too. You know why? You're human. They were humans back then, we're humans now. And I said it when we first launched Deuteronomy, from Israel to Arvada, we're just like them. We are forgetful people, all right, and this series is to look at Israel's life, at their past, Moses' uh, call to them to remember and say, hey, we're forgetful people too, and we need to remember who God is and, and who we are. But before you get frustrated again that you're not forgetful, let me just give you um, some biblical evidence really quickly that this is a part of human nature, and I'll do it really, really quickly. The Bible is actually bookended with two strong instances of forgetfulness. And that is my claim to say, not only is the Bible consistent with it and human, uh, with, with the stories in there, but that also reflects our human nature. For example, um, Adam and Eve, if we look at this scripture in Genesis 3, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at. Right there. What is she forgetting? What God said that it wasn't, wasn't to do. She, she, Rem, uh, she was not remembering what God said. It says, do not eat of the fruit. She forgot God's commandment. It's also bookended in the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. And Jesus is confronting a church that has forgotten their first love. He says this to the church of Ephesus. He says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. They have forgotten their first love. So for the very first book of the Bible to the last, our book ended basically the themes of humanity. We forget. And there's countless stories in between of 
our forgetfulness. Look, we're going to all struggle with this. The aim here is not to be perfect, all right? The goal here is to be less forgetful until Jesus takes us home, all right? The goal is not perfection because Jesus is perfect. He's the goal, all right? But we want to strive to be less forgetful. And we'll walk more in the wholeness of the Christian life and closer to Jesus the less we forget. So the the aim here is not to be um, the most remembering people ever. That is impossible. But the goal is to lessen it. All right, so this is where we're going for the entire series of Remember. Week one is we're going to be talking about re- remembering the God who gives. All right, that's our text today in Deuteronomy 8. But next week, we're going to be talking about remember your human nature. And then week three, remember God is God and we are not. And lastly, we're going to remember your God experiences. Those are four themes that we're going to be walking through. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Deuteronomy 8. Uh, If you have this blue book here, it is on page 40. All right, if you've got this blue book, if you don't have one of these, this is basically the book of Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of the Bible. This is for you. It's in the back. So if you would like one, Go ahead and get one, or someone on our team will hand you one. But on page 40, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is what Moses says to the Israelites. Carefully follow every command I'm giving you today, all right, so that you may live and increase and may enter and take possession of the land swore to your ancestors. Remember, there's our word, that the Lord your God led you on your entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known. Next slide. So that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out and your feet did not swell these 40 years. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been dis- uh, disciplining you just as man disciplines his son. So keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. This leads to our first observation from the text, and it's this. We remember the Lord who gives. And Moses, from these verses right here, is giving out the big reason why the Israelites should listen to him. He says, carefully follow every command I'm giving you today. And here is the why. So that you may what? Live and increase and may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your ancestors. If you're not familiar with that land, that's the promised land, okay? That's the the land God promised them to have. And for us, just like them, every human needs to know the why behind what they're doing, you know? Like, why am I doing this? We uh, fulfill the what when we know the why. And this is the why. He's saying, so that you may live and prosper in this land. This is the why. But let's break down the moments where Moses is pointing them to remember the Lord. He's strategic in this. And the first thing he says, take possession of the land, swore to your ancestors. Basically, he's reminding them of covenant. This is a Word that we've said over and over again. The covenant is God's promise to his people. It's stronger than a a, a contract. It is forever. It's eternal. It's divine. It's a promise that God has made that he's holding on to them. When we think we are holding on to God, in reality, God is holding on to us. It's his covenant with his people. He's reminding them, hey, I have given you my promise. I ain't letting go, all right? We say ain't where I'm from. He ain't letting go, all right? So he swore to it. He's pointing them to the covenant. He's also showing them, remember the God who gives you what you needed. So he reminds them of the covenant, but also what they needed. Moses retells uh, the story of this wandering around in the desert for 40 years, saying that it was God's purpose It was intentional that he did that for this to happen so they could be humbled and be drawn nearer to him. He also reminds them that God permitted hunger. He allowed them to be hungry so he could show them truly who was their provider. Now, that's kind of hard to wrap your minds around. 
but it was for their own good because God was allowing that to happen to show them he was what they truly needed. And in their hunger, God gave them manna, okay? And if you're not familiar with manna, it's one of the incredible miracles that God provided every single day. The real meaning of manna is unclear in Hebrew, but the closest uh, meaning or interpretation that we have for it is that it literally means, what is this? <laughs> that's what it literally means. And that's what the Israelites said when they were first introduced to it. And it came to them, they're like, what is this? <laughs> it's God's provision. And so manna fell from the sky each day, and it was the Israelites' sustenance. And God was intentionally using this to provide a culture of dependency on him. And how he did that was he had a little condition in it. If they stored more than what they needed, more than a day supply, the rest was spoiled. And he was conditioning them to say, I want you to depend on me daily. To say, I'm going to give what you need day by day. And the point of this daily provision was to keep them aware of God's promise, the covenant. I'm holding on to you. You think you're holding on to me, but I'm holding on to you. And this is summarized in the latter part of verse three. And he says, then he gave them manna to eat so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So what he's saying is, yes, you need bread, but what you need more of is my word, my promise, a dependency on me. What you need more than anything is a reliance on my omnipotent power. That's what you need. I'm married um, into a family that loves giving and receiving gifts, and they're really, really good at this. When it's time to open up gifts in my wife's family, um, they do a beautiful job of wrapping it, and they all put a card on the gift, and they um, kind of distribute the gifts. But what I notice with their family compared to my family, my family's great, but they just have a different tradition with gifts, is when they would get the gift, they would get the card on the gift, and they would unwrap the card and read the card and the note and who it was from, and then look at the person who gave the gift with the card and say, thank you, Aunt Tracy, for this gift, before they opened the gift. Now, what is happening here is Lacey's family was appreciating and honoring and elevating the giver above the gift. And that is the principle that Moses is wanting us to see here. He's trying to get the Israelites to say, hey, what I want you to do is to elevate the giver above the gift. Because when you do, you properly orient your mindset to knowing where your blessings come from. When you do that, you actually get what you will always need, and that is God. When we elevate the giver above the gift, we will always be in a position of getting what we need, not what we want. And the same is true for us. We need to elevate the giver above the gift. And this practice for us today is we need to be rem remembering that God is giving us every good and perfect thing. He's the source of everything we need, everything that we think we want. He says, I have something better. He is that. But more than that, we need to cherish him more than actually what he gives. We have a many blessings. We have salvation being the, the primary one. He gives us life and breath. And every single day, he's giving us blessings. But if we elevate the gifts above the giver, we can get into a dangerous zone. And that danger is that we can become formulaic or assume, again, here's the danger, that we think um, what, what we think the need is, is the gift it actually, oh, hold on, I'm saying this wrong. Uh, sometimes if we see only the gifts as the thing that we need and God gives us it in a different way, we're going to miss the blessing. Let me explain in a different way. I've told this story before, but in college, um, there was a girl that I dated for uh, over a year and I thought I was in love with her. And then we both graduated at the same time, and we broke up for the last and final time, and a couple months went by after that breakup, and I realized I did something dumb. I said, I need to marry this girl. So I come crawling back. I say, hey, I, I made a mistake. I, I shouldn't have 
broken up with you. Let's get back together. And this time, I'm, I'm serious. Let's get married. And she was not having it. She was not having it. So I said, I'm just going to double down. You know, I'm just going to pursue her harder. I'm going to call her every day. I'm going to, you know, send her scripture and I'm going to pray every day. And that wasn't working. And so I doubled down even more. I said, all right, I'm going to fast and pray. And every single day I would pray and almost to tears because I wanted to marry this girl. And, and what I was telling God, God, this is what I need. This is what I want. And God, if you're so loving, you would give this to me. And I would pray and pray. And this went on for two years. I was committed. It stopped when I found out that she was engaged and married another guy. And so that door closed really quickly. And it took a few uh, years later, but once I met and married Lacey, who is now my wife, it hit me that what I wanted wasn't what I needed. God was giving me a gift by not giving what I perceived as the gift. Make sense? Now, some of you are probably thinking of the Garth, Garth Brooks song, God's, God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. It's kind of a theologically true thing. <laughs> but yes, sometimes the gift that we need are the things that God doesn't answer the way that we think, we, uh, we think he should answer them. Does that make sense? The greatest gift is some of the unanswered prayers. The thing that we think that we need um, and want is not the actually thing that God says, I know you child, and I have the best interest for you. So if I do give this for you, based on your understanding, remember the omniscient, based on what I know, this would destroy your life, and I don't want your life to be destroyed. Had he given me this girl to marry, I would not be married today. It would have been a disaster. She wasn't called to ministry. We were like toxic. And I found out later, well, in some, in some hindsight, that I was more in lust than in love. God gave me what I needed, not what I wanted. I was putting the gift, the blessings of God over the actual blesser. I wasn't trusting God at all. I was leaning upon my own desires, my own wants, and drawing up how the reality was best fit for my life. But how about you? Is there a place in your life where you're elevating the gifts above the giver? The area where you have set an expectation of something going one way and it's just not happening. Maybe you're as pathetic as I am chasing something for two years, <laughs> you know, and it's just not happening. Now, there's, that's not to say to give up on stuff and, and, and plead desperate prayers, but what I'm saying to you is, is there something where you've not oriented it correctly? Like you're setting an expectation where God is saying, I actually have something better for you, child. Will you just let me give you what you need? And you're going to find that, that it's him every single time. I want to challenge you this morning to change your perspective a bit if that's you. Maybe the giver is giving you a gift. Think about it this way. Could the waiting be a gift because God was wanting to build your character more than anything? Think about that. Could it also be that the redirection be a gift because God was moving you out of a future disaster? You know, hindsight helps us see that all the time, right? And lastly, could the wound or hurtful experience be the gift because God was wanting you to excel in, um, in empathy and minister to others with the same hurt in the future? Now, that's hard to wrap your mind around. God, why? Maybe God was preparing you. Remember, we've talked about the friend being in the ditch and the priest and then the doctor come by and they can't help him out of the ditch. And then the friend comes by and jumps in the hole. And the friend's like, why did you jump in the hole with me. And you say, well, I know how to get out. Maybe the wound or the hard season was a gift so you can be a gift to someone else later. And then lastly, could the closed door, and this happens to a lot, especially in professional careers or, you know, God, why did you move me here? Could the closed door an opportunity of a lifetime going away be something that was never meant to bless you? What I say in my family is every closed door was never meant to bless you. 
God has his, your best interest in his heart. Can we just trust that? The giver of all good gifts knows what's best for you and me. It's hard to believe that, but in his presence and power will show us. And as we continue and pick up in verse seven, we're gonna see the second thing that we need to remember is remember the response to the Lord. Remember the response to the giver of all good things. Let's read verses seven through 10. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams, springs, and deep water sources flowing in both valleys and hills. Sounds like Montana. A land of wheat, barley, vines, figs, and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land where you will eat the food without shortage, where you will lack nothing. A land whose rocks are iron and from whose hills you will mine copper. When you, are, uh, when you eat and are full, you will bless the Lord your God for the, la- for the good land he has given you. The instructions are clear, all right? Moses is saying, um, you're about to experience the blessings and gifts of God. Be ready. What you're about to walk into is going to be great, and you're going to respond to those great things by blessing the Lord. Now, what does this mean? To bless the Lord in this context, and when you interpret it, means to kneel down. And what does kneeling down communicate? It communicates humility. It communicates, hey, I'm not in control, you are. It's a posture of gratitude and thankfulness. But it was more than a posture of physicality. It was a posture of spirituality. They were acknowledging when you bless the Lord, I am literally not in control, you are God. Every good thing that I have comes from you. I am powerless and you are not. You are full of power. Everything I have comes from from you. In other words, Moses is saying, be quick to give God credit for what he's done. Be grateful and acknowledge God's goodness, his gifts, his blessings in your life. Worship the giver as you experience his gifts. One thing I brought for me, I mentioned earlier, I say the word ain't. I try to um, not bring every Southern thing that I have. I'm from the South, but one of the things in the South that we pride ourselves on, even though there's still road rage, is the um, a complimentary wave, right? You know, when you're um, letting somebody over or you need to get over when you're merging in a lane, what we do in the South is when somebody lets you over, right, that's behind you, you just give them the wave, right? You don't need to kind of go crazy with it. You just give the, hey, thanks. You didn't have to do that. Thank you. Now, when I'm, I do that here. Like when people let me over, I'm, I make sure that I, I do that. That's, that's kind, right? I have not experienced one time in the three years that I lived here, somebody doing that to me when I let them over. Denver drivers are horrible at this. I don't know what it is. If you don't do this, start doing it. Let's start a movement of the wave coming back, all right? And the other thing that I want to bring back, you know, some of you may be tempted to give the middle finger, and that, that may happen, but I have some friends that are starting a movement. Instead of the mi- middle finger, just give them a thumbs down, right? <laughs> Maybe we could do that. Like, hey, that wasn't cool. Thumbs down, all right? So let's bring the thumbs down and the wave in, all right? That's like balance it out because people need to know wasn't cool, right? So, <laughs> so the wave is the thing that says, I'm acknowledging what you've done for me. I'm acknowledging the situation. And what Moses is doing is saying, I want you not to be like the Denver drivers. I want you to wave. I want you to acknowledge what God has done. And the same is true for us. Moses is establishing a, a culture of thanksgiving in the people, and I want to establish in us a culture of thanksgiving in our church and every believing community. And we too, as followers of Jesus, need to establish a culture of thanksgiving and honor and a culture of blessing the Lord in our church, in our homes, in our lifestyles. Why? Because when we do, it draws us nearer to God. It helps our brains focus and we have a better outlook on life. And most importantly, as we glorify God, the world sees God's glory when we have a culture of thanksgiving. When we point out the good things God is doing, when we have recognition of what he's doing, it helps the world see the greatness 
at our God. Deuteronomy 8.10 it says, look at this phrase. For the good land he has given you. Look at that phrase. What preceded that phrase? A lot of details of the land and the type of land that they were going to have. They were going to be blessed by physical attributes of the land. They were going to have water and the food and the crops they would inherit. And they would also be able to create commerce and prosper as a nation with the the mines that they were going to have. What Moses is doing is showing God's blessings are expansive and robust. They're all over. Just open your eyes. Be cognizant to what is around you. Even the mundane, simple things are the blessings from God. The everyday things are evidences of God providing for us. Same is true for us. Yes, we have salvation. We praise God for that. Thank you, God, for saving us. I was a sinner. I was in darkness, and you brought me into light. But it's also the daily things that you encounter every single day. It's a wonderful thing to praise God after the first sip of coffee. That is a gift. Like, coffee is a gift. It's a natural thing. Coffee's a great gift. Thank him for the view that you might have of the mountains, that you get to live where you get to live. And if you don't have a great view, let me just be real with you. About five minute drive, you have a great view. So thank him for the five minute drive to get a great view. If you don't know what to be thankful for, just look at the thing in front of you and start to deconstruct it. Um, uh, counselors use this with people that have eating habits. They want them to slow down, or bad eating habits, they want them to slow down. They say, hey, when you take a bite of a hamburger, start to deconstruct it. Think about every single part of it and you'll eat less. But what they're tapping into is the robustness and the expansiveness of everything that we have comes from God orchestrating all of these things together. Think about the hamburger. Look at this. Isn't that all good? Maybe some of you will have that this afternoon. But think about it. Before it hits the first um, bite of your mouth, before eating it, it had to be made, right? People had to construct that together, if not you. Thank God for the kitchen or the restaurant you had access to. Isn't that cool? Like, you, we, like after this, we have like restaurants that like probably 99% of the time we're not going to get sick from. Like we're going to go get food and we're going to go get that. Thank him that there's a good chance that you're not going to die and get sick from the food that we eat or make. That's awesome. Thank you, God. But before the kitchen, that burger and all of its ingredients were processed somewhere in a factory. All right? Think about the hamburger. Or, you know, everybody loves meat until they know how it's made. Right? Somebody does that for us, all right? If you've ever processed meat, if you're a hunter, you know that is gory and gruesome. And the fact that we have people that do it for us is an awesome blessing. It makes you appreciate your food even more. But even think about that. People wash that lettuce, cut those onions, um, um, packaged the tomatoes, all of that. And they did that preceding you, you eating the bite of that hamburger. It goes even deeper um, that God put all that into motion, that all the people that show up on time, that wake up, that are healthy, that go to the factories to work to make sure that we have food. God is putting all of that together. I'm serious about this. This is really intricate stuff that God is holding the whole world in his hands and keeping things in motion. It goes even further. Think about those ingredients before they were uh, in a factory. Where were they? On a farm. The tomatoes, the cows, the lettuce, everything that we ate did not exist before it was grown. It just, we didn't add water and it had to be, a seed had to be planted, things had to be cultivated, farmers had to pull weeds and all this kind of things. But go even further than the farmer. I'm getting really deep, y'all. The farmer has to have the most trust of anybody in this whole process because he can only do a few certain things. He plants the seeds, cultivates it, waters it. But at the end of the day, he has to trust who? And it's this mysterious process of the seed dying, going into the ground, and we get food. And so my whole point all this, all the things that we experience every single day are blessings upon blessings, miracles upon miracles. Yes, we innovate and create. We have a part in that, all right? Like humans have a role in all of these things. 
but it's God working all of these things together. The greatest discoveries that we have in this world are only God's blessings to allow us to know these things and to discover these things and to invent these things. You can literally take anything and trace it back to God's design and provision for us. So when you see something every day, even the book, this book, God, thank you for the printing press. Thank you for the tree that had to be grown for this, the technology to print stuff, the the person that had a desire to make this journal for me. God, you put all of this into motion. The uh, The things that we can be grateful for are all over the world. Can we just open our eyes to that and elevate the giver? Because his gifts are everywhere. Why is it important that we cultivate a lifestyle of blessing the Lord, to be thankful? Why is it important to to have this culture of thankfulness? Skip down to verses 17 through 20. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability gain this wealth for me. This is Moses talking to the Israelites. Go back to that last slide. Um, This is a rhetorical thing. He's like saying, hey, you might say this. You might say that your own ability have gained this wealth for me. Next slide. But remember, remember, here's the word again, remember. He's pointing them to remember who the Lord is and who they are. Remember that the Lord, your God, gives you the power to gain wealth. In order to confirm his covenant, he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods to serve them and bow and worship to them, I testify against you today that you will certainly perish. Like the nations the Lord is about to destroy before you, you will perish if you do not obey the Lord your God. It's pretty simple. If we do not respond with thankfulness to God, we'll respond by taking the credit ourselves. If we start believing our press clippings and we start you know, taking for granted the things that we have in life, we'll start believing, well, this came from my own wealth, my own hard work, my own innovation. That begins a process of where a heart becomes hardened. We, as followers of Jesus, yes, we can take credit for things that we've done, but ultimately, it is God that has given us the permission to do the things and to receive the things that we have. He is literally the giver of every good thing for us. Now, I don't believe there's a liter- literal perishing if we miss this, okay? There's not a literal um, of that. We talked about the hardening of your heart of that. And as I studied this passage this week, and it struck me, it reminded me, and it was quite fitting, because a week from today, we will be celebrating our one-year anniversary. Yes! But as excited as I am about that, as I was studying this, um, I was reminded of all the great things we've seen God do. We've seen God do amazing things in the last year as we celebrated this church. And what gets me uh, so excited is is not um, where we've been, but where we're going. Like, this is just the start. Like, the people in this room, you guys are going to see more people in this room a year from now. I don't see that, say that in, a, like, a prideful way or an arrogant way. I just believe God is doing something in our midst, and you guys are going to be a part of it. And so I'm just, I'm excited to be a part of the ride with you. Like, God is going to do some amazing things, and he's going to do it in healthy ways, too. The goal here is not to be a mega church. The goal here is to reach people, and I believe that we will do it. But as we look forward to that, I do have a healthy fear that as your pastor, as the church planter of this church, um, that I can become susceptible uh, like other pastors who've experienced growth to become prideful and take for granted the work that God has done. And you've seen it. You've, it's happened in this state and all over the country where you've seen moral failings. And the moral failings just doesn't happen overnight. You can go all the way back to a slow leak where the pastor starts beginning to think of his own press clippings, right? They become hardened and they become isolated. They get move away from the people that helped them build the church. And they start believing, well, 
you know, we're here because I can preach the pain off the walls. Or we're here because, you know, I, you know, am very strategic leader and I hired the right staff and I know how to build teams and I'm an attractive leader and people want to come see me. They start believing that. And over time, the pastor is no longer the lead champion of responding to the giver above the gifts. He starts elevating the gifts and thinks that he is the gift to the church. And the church then becomes a church that God doesn't want to respond to. And they become an unmanageable, egotistical jerk. And the pastor be- forgets who's actually building the church, and it's God. I share that because my greatest fear as a pastor is being like them. I mean it. I've seen it far too many times in people who start off with good intentions to reach a city, to start a new kingdom movement, and they have God's blessing, and they get used to it, and they stop praying desperate prayers, stop being um, um, seeking his heart, and they start relying on their own strength and believing that they're the gift to the church and not the giver, or not, and not pointing people to the giver. And this text, again, was a reminder that I don't want to be that. I don't want us to be that. I never want us to get complacent with God doing amazing things. I never want to lose the culture of thanksgiving and praising God and pointing people, you know, when we see amazing things, God did that. Like, I don't want to lose that. And that's why we're so passionate about prayer. And I want to invite you a week or this week, this Wednesday night in this room at 630, could we have a room filled like this for prayer? Like, that's why we pray. You literally are the fruit of prayer. Like, yes, we did some marketing. Yes, we invited. But the fact that you're actually here is God leading you to be here because of prayer. The dozens and almost hundreds of people that have been praying for the last three years for this church, you are the fruit of prayer, and we do not want to stop. If you've been to a prayer night, raise your hand. They're pretty good. I mean, like, it's not like some boring kind of, um, they're really good moments. And so, uh, please come this Wednesday night at 630. If you can't be there right at 630, come late. Be there. But my ask to you as I share my heart on this is will you help me stay humble? You can pop me if you need to. Will you encourage? Blair goes, you bet. (laughs) But how we do that is we collectively keep a culture of thanksgiving. We honor God in the small and in the big. We say the hallelujahs, we pray. And I love this church. You guys are a singing and worship-filled church. I love it. Let's do that. Let's do that together. But what about you today? Where in your life are you not remembering the Lord well? Are you relying on your own strength? Are you not seeing him as the supreme giver you're, you're, or maybe you're elevating the gifts above the giver today. You're expecting God to do one thing, and he's saying, child, if you would just listen, I want to do something else. That's actually better. Where do you need to let God give you the better thing? And where do you need in your life to begin remembering and responding with thanksgiving? And here is the exact thing that all of us need to respond to. What do you need to do to be a person that grows out of forgetfulness and grows into a lifetime of remembering the God who gives. What do you need to do to help you do that today? And the greatest gift, how we do this on and on, the greatest gift that we've been given is God's son, Jesus. If you've never received that gift, I want to lead you through a prayer in a minute as we pray to receive that gift today. But as we close TLC, I pray that you and I overcome our tendency to forget and that we pursue a lifetime of remembering who God is and who we are in light of that and that we're consciousness to the faithfulness that our God gives to us every single day. Let's pray. God, you are the giver and we elevate you above everything. And today I just wanna pray for the person that has never received the gift of your salvation. And how you receive that gift is you simply say, I believe. And what you're believing is, 
And if something's churning in your heart today that you believe, God, this is the day that I, that I really want to follow you. If this is you, listen up. You're choosing to believe that Jesus lived the perfect life, that he was God's son. But there were some people on this world that didn't like what he had to say, and there was this whole movement of crucifying him uh, to, to, to crush him, to put him to death. And Jesus knew this, but he was willing to die. He didn't stop it. Remember, he's omnipotent. He could have, but he didn't stop the cross. And so he willingly was crucified because he knew that his crucifixion, his death on the cross was going to bring life, that his blood, the wounds, his brokenness were all a payment for our sins. And then Jesus would die, and then he would be buried in a tomb. But remember our omnipotent God, three days later, with all power, even power over death, rose Jesus from the grave. And he showed himself to the disciples and then ascended into heaven. And what you're believing today is that story, that he lived a perfect life, that he died for you, that he was buried, and he rose three days later. And your belief in that gives you the gift of salvation. And if you're here today um, and you're ready to receive that gift, no one's looking around, every eye closed, will you just raise your hand? If you're still processing that of how to follow Jesus, we want to follow up with you. On the back of the Connect card, um, that's where most of our information is. Just check, I want to follow Jesus or I want more information and, and we'll follow up. But God, we want to be people who elevate the giver above the gifts. We are satisfied with everything that you give us. May we be a church that does that well. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand and respond to the giver of all good things.